What's going on guys, it's Bromley at Empire Barbell and today we're gonna to cover post activation potentiation. If you guys found this video helpful, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. We're putting out a lot of content every week. You wanna make sure you don't have to play catch up. So post activation potentiation is one of these clunky phrases that explains something that's pretty straightforward but oftentimes people see a textbook phrase like this and their eyes kind of glaze over. So breaking down this word, post just means after. Activation, we're talking about muscle fiber recruitment, activating motor units. Potentiation just means optimizing. If you're potentiating something, you are optimizing its potential. So that's what we're looking at. So really just looking at a phrase that describes a way of optimizing the amount of motor units that get recruited in any given time. So this is important for explosive movements or movements where some type of all out effort is required. So we think about this specifically with speed work. Now think about a very light movement like a box jump or a standing broad jump. You're trying to put out as much force as possible, but it's over a very, very short period of time. So if you remember when we went over the, the force velocity curve, uh, the way the human body applies force, we are limited in how much force we can put out if we only have a very short period of time to do it. So that becomes a very different animal than strength where we have a few seconds to reach maximal fiber recruitment and speed where we're trying to get as many fibers recruited in a very, very short period of time. So this is one way to kind of trick our bodies into recruiting more units in that very short time frame. So if you go into a very light movement like a plyometric and you jump, there's a ceiling on how much force you're gonna be able to put out because it happens so short, you don't have time to exceed that motor unit recruitment. So there's this idea that if we prime ourselves with some harder effort, if we recruit higher threshold motor units first, and then go back and engage in the explosive movement that we actually can produce more force in that time, which means that we can jump a little higher uh, on lighter sets, we can do a few more reps. So from the perspective of an athlete, like a track athlete or a football player, somebody that's on a field having to run, jump, change direction quickly, we can use these tactics to try and increase our ability to move explosively in those very small time frames. So the first example of post-activation potentiation is going to be starting with a weighted movement and then going into a much lighter explosive movement. So if you are like a track athlete, and let's say you participate in something like a high jump or a broad jump, you might start your training with some type of weighted movement and alternate back and forth between that movement and the actual skill that you're trying to develop. So you might do something like a clean pull, something like a speed squat or speed deadlift, something like a weighted jump, like a squat jump. And doing that is going to recruit more high threshold motor units first, so that when you then go into something like the broad jump, you find that you can actually get a little bit farther because you already have more motor units online. You've already potentiated your ability to activate those muscle fibers. Now, one of the keys here is to make sure that speed and power output is the primary thing that we're looking for. And that means not getting overly fatigued. Going into some type of plyometric movement is not going to benefit you and you're not going to do well if you have fatigued yourself in this threshold. So we keep it to traditional speed work thresholds, meaning singles, doubles, triples. And we make sure that while it's heavy and while we're trying to go as hard as we can, we're not fatiguing ourselves. You don't want the bar speed slowing down. You don't want to feel any substrate deficit. You don't want to feel any buildup of waste products. You should not feel fatigued. It should be a few hard, quick touches, about 30 seconds of rest, and then you go into this. So a good example is when I was drilling the bag tosses, I'm not very explosive and I was having trouble with the bags. Uh, a good option for that would be to do something like a clean pull. You want these movements to be similar. It's not going to help you to go from let's say a weighted hinge movement into a weighted like squat or D dominant movement. So you want them similar. So for me, it might be like, let's say a very heavy kettlebell swing for a few reps, take a short break and then go into the bag toss. If I'm swinging a hundred pound kettlebell for three or four reps, and then I go to throw a 40 pound bag, that 40 pound bag is going to feel much lighter and I'm physically gonna be able to move it much faster and get it a lot higher than I would have if I was cold. So that's an example of post-activation potentiation at play. A uh, clean pull would have been another good example. Usually when we think of athletic movements, we're talking about from the waist down, but this can absolutely be applied to upper body as well. Uh, you can imagine scenarios where somebody who has to move their upper body very quickly would benefit from pairing weighted upper body movements to uh, lighter, more explosive movements. You might go from a speed bench press to a plyometric push-up. You might go from let's say uh, some type of jerk or some type of overhead rack support to a shot put or to a medicine ball throw. So you absolutely have a lot of diversity and a lot of options when you do that. Now, because we're gonna be keeping the weights lower, this isn't necessarily max effort work. 
even on the weighted stuff, our loads are reduced to not cause excess fatigue or form breakdown. So this is very much a, a speed or explosive day, which is going to benefit athletes more than anything. Uh, I don't want any of you lifters to think that this is somehow the key to getting your lifts up because it likely isn't, but it can help you when you do need to be explosive. So again, uh, athletes, if you have to run fast, jump high, if you have to be physically explosive, and then Strongman has a ton of events that are gonna benefit from something like this. Highland Games athletes actually as well. So keep that in mind. All right, now the second option for post-activation potentiation that is actually going to be more relevant for you lifters involves doing the heavier sets first and the lighter sets after. Now with this, we're still gonna get a lot of the benefit of post-activation potentiation, but it's not going to be so much speed oriented. You will notice the lighter sets move a little bit quicker, but in addition to that, your sense of the weight is going to be that it, it doesn't feel as heavy or as strenuous, which means you'll be able to practice technical execution a little bit better. Uh, and on uh, higher rep sets, you'll be able to actually get more reps in in a single set than if you would have started it cold. So that provides a really big training benefit. The examples that I use, reverse pyramids are probably the easiest ones to execute, where instead of pyramiding up, now pyramiding up has advantages, where you pyramid up, you do your higher rep sets first, so you get heavier and heavier. So you build fatigue first and volume first, and then you experience some strain later on in the workout and there's value in that fatigue is a good marker for growth and you're still getting some neurological stimulation that is strength specific even though it's not completely optimized but pyramids work very well but the thing that grows you is going to have more to do with the total volume it's going to have more to do with the fatigue you build up this is going to be more strength specific because you handle the heaviest loads when you're fresh and then you get to exploit post-activation potentiation on those lighter sets where they're going to feel light so that's a benefit. One of the ways you can write it out is going something like two, four, six, eight, all the way down and just picking weights that you think are appropriate for that range, adding a marginal amount of weight every time you do it. Another example is just to set percentages, say go 90, 80, 70%, and just do as many as you can on each one, taking five or six minutes in between to make sure you're recovered enough. You want to let that fatigue dissipate so you can actually express the increase in performance. Now, if you're going to failure, you're not going to do quite as many sets. Whereas if these are a little bit sub-maximal, you'll be able to do more sets, get more volume in that way. There's other ways to do this. Wave loading within the workout is something I'm actually going to cover pretty soon. That involves building up over a couple sets, dropping back, building up again, and you might do that three or four times. And you'll find that every time you get to the highest percentage, even though you've done more volume in that time, it should be more fatigue you find that you actually get a better result. Olympic weightlifters have used that with success. I've used it with success on some strongman movements where uh, confidence with the implement along with the need to keep technique sound actually benefits from all of those reduced weight sets where you get a, once again, reinforced technique. So there's some examples where wave loading works very well and that does the same thing. Another good example that's a little more exotic is with uh, accommodating resistance. Travis Mash, who used to train at Westside Barbell back in the day, has talked about uh, speed work. And in an interview he did with Chris Duffin, he talked about how the guys didn't really take speed work that seriously, but once they would throw the bands on, after they would do their initial speed work, they would just keep climbing up, hit a max in the context of the bands adding resistance at the top, then take the bands off and continue going up. And because the max they hit with the bands had so much tension at the top, it stimulated their nervous system and it allowed them to hit new heights once they peeled the bands off and worked up to a new max. Now, I don't necessarily recommend that methodology. Those guys were savages and had little regard for keeping their bodies in one piece. That essentially amounts to two maximal sessions in the same lift every week. But it does give insight on how you can get creative with the ways that you stress your body to kind of trick it into getting a better result. So the last example and something you guys have probably seen and not really known that it fell under the umbrella of post-activation potentiation are top sets. It's very common to see uh, powerlifting programs where the top set is done first and then the percentage is dropped and all of the volume is gotten after the top set. And that provides a very tangible benefit especially in the context of powerlifting, where you want all of that volume to be as fast, as controlled, and technically precise as possible. So that's just yet another example of where this gets employed. So if you're not used to putting your heavy work first, give that a shot. If any of you guys are athletes or you are looking to increase your just general explosive abilities, these are some supersets that you can try. 
uh, pairing together weighted movements with jumps and various other explosive variations. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into something you might have seen talked about and passed around, uh, but not really fleshed out. If you have any questions about this, go ahead and leave it in the comment box or take it to the forum, empire-forum.com. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.